Okay, it's time to start our test three review. Uh, here's the basic things you need to know about test three. It's on Wednesday, April 15th in the evening. It's online because the whole course is online now. We've had lots of announcements about this. It's up to an hour and 45 minutes. It's an extra 15 minutes compared to the usual ones because of how we're offering it. We've also gone over that in the announcements. It'll be available as a test between 6.45 and 9 p.m., but there's a cutoff at 9 p.m. So if you start too late, uh, you don't get 105 minutes. That's why it says up to. <clears throat> uh, you should have your normal things, equation sheet, calculator, pencils, uh, but you need some other things. You need your own scratch paper because we can't hand that through the computer. You need to have either printed or written out the page that has the formulas or conversions. It's usually on the test. You can find it on Moodle. You get that extra in addition to your equation sheet because uh, we couldn't figure out a way to get it to show at the same time as the test on Moodle. <clears throat> You need something to take and upload a photo. I hope you've tried that on the practice test. If you haven't, it's available. You should take the practice test just to see how this works so that you don't get uh, tripped up by it on the test time and hurt your test performance. And of course, you need a device to take the Moodle test and it's gotta have JavaScript done so that Moodle can uh, bring into test screen mode. <laughs> okay, so the big messages start on time. Uh, we open up the introductory parts at 6.30. So if you get those done, you can get going right at 6.45. Uh, we've got a half an hour window after that before you're going to start running into your uh, hour and 45 minutes for taking the test and not get it. So <clears throat> you can get the picture uploaded and the pack pledge finished before you uh, before that 6.45 if you want to really get going right away. So what is the format? A little bit different than usually, so I modified this. It's 21 questions from 8C to 17B, but only 20 of them count. So you get one wrong one for uh, not counted. If you get everything right, then okay, it would be one right one. but. Uh, if you get everything right, you should be happy anyway. <clears throat> uh, there'll be one question from the homework or a piece of a question from the homework and one question from test two. The numbers might be different on both of those, but that's the, how you do it and how it looks will be the same. Uh, again, you have to get those constants conversions normally at the first page printed, or if you don't have a printer, you can write them down. Um, that's otherwise it's like usual. <clears throat> uh, there'll be a mix of questions like usual. There'll be extraneous information sometimes like usual. There'll be wrong answers that are using the wrong formula, formula or a real physics mistake. It will show up there sometimes. Uh, topic order is randomized. Questions delivered four at a time. And once you answer all four of those, however which way you want to, going back, however much you want to within those four, you say, okay, I'm done with these four. Give me the next four. And so uh, that will go on. <clears throat> uh, and if you want to know what you did later on, you can write your answers down on your scratch paper as you go. So you can compare it to the key or so on, <clears throat> or just to know what you did. Uh, if you have a question, you're going to have to email it to me because we're not going to have any Zoom things set up or anything else. That's the only way. That the uh, two things to about this, though. Uh, I might be overwhelmed if there's lots of the same question. And so uh, don't do it at the last second. And as far as electronic activity goes, normally we prohibit any electronic devices. Well, this time you need something to take the test on. So obviously that's one use. You're allowed to do that to take the test only. And then if you have a question, you're allowed to email me. And so you can do that either on that same computer or you can do it on a different device, but again, the pack pledge applies. It's only for questions and getting the answer to the question. Don't get caught up in your other email. You're not supposed to be looking at that during a test. And uh, 
course, you're not supposed to be uh, uh, doing other things. <clears throat> so, uh, and as usual, don't discuss the test in public until after Friday. <clears throat> you might say, well, is there really, should I be going into public? And the answer is probably not, but uh, just in case you happen to meet somebody, it's uh, after Friday. Okay, so let me then pop you over because I want to show you how the practice test looks on Moodle. And uh, to do that, uh, I'm going to pop over to Moodle here if I can find it. Where is my, where is my Moodle? Um, uh, here it is. <clears throat> so, this is what the Moodle looks like for the sample test, 21 questions that um, you'll take after you, after you study. Um, and it gives you the delivery questions, the test timing and feel, but it won't cut you off at nine o'clock. Uh, so there's a little note up here that talks about that. <clears throat> um, this particular one, you can start whenever you want to. You do have to go through the order. You do have to have things completed and that's how the real one will work. And then again, uh, the top two will be open <clears throat> at 6.30 and the bottom two will be open at 6.45 on test day. And you better start by 7.15, this bottom link, if you want your full uh, <clears throat> hour and 45 minutes to complete the test. Okay, um, back to our PowerPoint. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go through this again because I actually wanna point out some things that may be helpful to you. Now we have so many different possible types of topics. It's useful to see how they fit together. So, <clears throat> think about the overriding strategy. What type of problem is it? And I mean, what type? I mean, is it an energy problem? Is it a Newton's second law problem? Is it a kinematics problem? And I noticed how I didn't say it is a rotational, sec, uh, Newton's second law or rotational kinematics. You tell which type of problem it is the same way, whether it's rotation or not rotation. You look for the same sort of things. So this test isn't really that much more than the old ones. It's just a different twist to it. <clears throat> Uh, so once you identify, you follow the process for that type, and uh, you might um, get the process down, you rework problems so you can solve them and do it efficiently. Uh, if there are plenty of resources on Moodle, if you go to the bottom of how to be successful, there's a few documents on how to recognize different types of problems, how to go through and solve them. Uh, there are at least two or three different ways of doing it in different documents. Look at, find the one that works well for you, practice it so you've got it down. And then you'll find that there's really just, you know, five or six types of problems plus some definitions <clears throat> uh, that you need to know. Um, you have to have the definitions ready to go. They're normally easier for people to spot to get going. But uh, the other ones, there's hints on how to spot them. So take a look at those if you're still having trouble. And remember the big picture here of Newton's second law is a Newton's second law and it's valid at all times. There's no initials, no final. Those are the kind of things that I want you to <clears throat> pick up so that you have an easier time getting going on these problems and you're not overwhelmed, as I think some of you might be feeling right now. Okay, and so uh, as you're going through these processes, make sure that you get your equation sheet uh, to help you along and you can write what you want. You can write down some of these hints, you can write down all the possible types of, of um, problems. And so you remember which types to think about <clears throat> and a few hints about them and how to get started. You might actually wanna organize it that way if you think it will be more efficient and you can kind of combine the rotation and the linear together at the same a uh, piece in the equation sheet so that it's more efficient for you to get through. Uh, you don't have to, of course, but I would not, um, I would not rule that out. <clears throat> okay, so 
back to the major principles of the course. We have kinematics, constant acceleration. We have conservation of energy. We have collisions. And there's the single thing you're interested in, collision with the impulse and so on, including rotation as well as linear. And there's uh, conservation of momentum type ones. There's Newton's second laws, F equals MA, and the tension for static and so on. And as you go to the <clears throat> rotation stuff, the stuff on this test, well, we also have old fashioned collisions. We have the rotation version of kinematics, constant acceleration. We have conservation of energy where you've got to put in a rotational kinetic energy term. Potential energies don't really change that much. They're still unlike they were. And conservation of momentum where you've got an angular version of um, I omega initial, summing them all up is the sum of them all up in the final case. If you have no external forces. Newton's second law, we've got static equilibrium where in addition to the sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero and static, a x is zero, and the sum of y forces equal to zero and static, a y is equal to zero, you also have the sum of the torques, our torque is zero. So those three things can help you through. If you choose your rotation axis correctly, you sometimes can avoid doing the x and y sums. Uh, rotational dynamics uh, is just like F equals ma, except you sum the torques rather than the forces, and you set it equal to the moment of inertia i times the angular acceleration alpha rather than the mass times the linear acceleration. Again, you solve it the same way. You make a chart. You write things down and you will get through it um, just fine. You recognize it the same way, too. Uh, so let's now go through uh, some of the topics. Uh, chapter 8, we started on test 2. Test 2 topics there are from chapter 8. Uh, the last three, elastic collisions, inelastic collisions, and perfectly inelastic collisions, which of course you recognize by things sticking together, both rotational and linear. They're both on this test. Same as rotational collisions. It's on this test. <clears throat> so you have both linear and rotational. And so uh, this is kind of the equations that go with it. How do you tell if you have a collision? Well, something happens pretty abruptly. And now is time I'm going to pop over to our document camera here and we'll begin there. So <clears throat> here we are. <clears throat> and I wanted to note a couple of things at the top here is how do you tell a collision problem? Well, <clears throat> It's usually something abrupt, uh, not much information about it. And uh, there's often no potential energy changes. Sometimes if you're looking for a speed, you might say, well, is this a collision problem or is this a Conservation of energy problem. Well, if there isn't really any potential energy changes going on in the problem, then it's probably hard for it to be a conservation of energy problem. That speed you're looking for might come from one of the speeds in the momentum formula, right? <clears throat> uh, the other thing about <clears throat> collisions is it does have a uh, initial and final which can also be a before or after, right? It's a different way of saying it. Uh, so expect that. <clears throat> expect something that's not really talked too much about. And these can be rotate. Well, right now we're doing the linear stuff, but we'll get to rotation later. And how do you tell it from an energy problem that also has an initial final, right? Constant acceleration also has an initial final, kinematics. Uh, how do you um, tell it from that? Well. If time is involved, or if you're said this uniformly accelerates, well, then it's the kinematics. Uh, if um, 
<clears throat> if it's abrupt with not much info, it's probably going to be a collision, especially if we say no external forces act, things like that. The uh, main things that you're going to be looking at here are the, uh, we put in this in because that's obviously kinetic energy. Now, this is too, this is a combination of Ke plus momentum. Uh, but these two equations are easy to work with. And for 1D elastic. And we are, for our elastic collisions, we're staying in 1D. And so you'll be able to use these two. If it's inelastic, it could be 2D. That's what the X and Y stands for. This one thing in X, one thing in Y. So this is really two equations. x and y <clears throat> oftentimes it's just one dimensional not always and if it isn't you're going to have to solve two if it is then you just have to solve one of them the initial is the final for the sums of the momentums linear momentums in this case if you look for at the top of elastic it's the same thing if you look in perfectly in elastic it's the same thing the only thing that perfectly in elastic is things stick together so if you see a problem and something gets stuck to something else, think perfectly inelastic collision, think momentum conservation. That's likely what it's going to be. It's not guaranteed, but it's pretty likely that that's gonna show up somewhere. Okay, so, uh, and then what is, uh, you know, what is a problem like this look like? I guess we can, we can do a, a quick example is a um, uh, the um, collision balls. Oh, before I get to the collision balls, um, let me remind this thing. It's a, it's a what are the most important things to study? Again, I've told this to you before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, homeworks. Uh, the problems done problems and questions from class, even if it's online class, they're still from class. And uh, this is where a lot of the qualitative stuff comes from here. Some, there's some quantitation there that you should know a lot of that's similar to homework. There's some quantitative stuff, that, uh, qualitative stuff that goes on here. And don't forget the demonstrations. I think uh, if you look back at our other tests this semester, you will see a few questions in there that if you remember the demonstration and why it did what it did, it helped. We like to connect the real world to your course your tests. That's one way to do it, it's the real world straight in. And then uh, those are the most important things to study. If you can do all those, you're in, you're in pretty good shape. And, and then uh, and there's also the, the, the quizzes, but the quizzes are mainly things that um, uh, from class, uh, a lot of them re-showed up there so that we could work them out in, uh, in a more coherent manner than just my few words after it. And of course, there's other problems in the book. There's examples in the book. There's um, <clears throat> uh, other pieces. These two, if you can do this, you're limited. Then just do that. You also, have your notes, book, so on. Uh, these are key. Let's get back to this. We had collision balls. And if you remember what those looked like, is we held one ball up here. And then we had a bunch of balls 
in a row. And they all have the same mass m. So this is initial. And then uh, for the moment, we can just sort of take any of these out. And let's just look at the first one. So the final, uh, well, the initial is even going to be simpler than this. This is the demonstration. And then later, this one's coming down. It's moving with a velocity v. And it's about to run into the next one here, which is at rest. And then there's going to be a collision. Something happens. Bang. And then uh, these things are now in some unknown state. So here's what we know about this. They're all the same mass. The collision is elastic. The collision is head on. And uh, we want final uh, final um, uh, velocity of both of them. <clears throat> so in between here, by the way, is a energy problem. So work non-conserving is equal to delta Ke plus delta Pe. Um, this something happening with a bang, that's a collision. That's our problem. So uh, we want the final velocities. And let's just say in terms of V uh, initial uh, or V1 initial is equal to V, V2 initial is equal to zero. <clears throat> okay, so if you look at this head on, what does that mean? That means it's 1D. It's elastic, 1D elastic. We have these two equations. That's good. The same masses. So set M1 equal M2 equal M. The moving one is one. That's one, that's two. <clears throat> so V1 initial is equal to V. V2 initial is equal to zero. The collision here, we determined by the bang, and because I told you it's collision balls, it should figure it out. This tells us with the elastic part here that we have two equations. Uh, the collision itself tells us that M1 uh, V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial is equal to M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. That's what actually collision tells us. And what the elastic part tells us is uh, this V1 minus V2 initial is equal to, you flip it around, it's V2 minus V1. V2 final minus V1 final. So these are the two we have. Now let's put in our values. Uh, the top one here gets to be uh, M V one initial plus zero is equal to M V one final plus M V two final. The M's cancel out because they're the same. 
I took off the ones and twos when I copied it to our case. And the other one here, uh, so this just uh, relates those two. This one in the bottom becomes uh, V1 initial is equal to uh, <coughs> V2 final minus V1 final. So <coughs> we have two equations for these things. We can set them equal to each other. And that allows us to serve. Um, so left side's the same. So set right side's equal. And so you get V1 final plus V2 final is equal to V2 final minus V1 final. Um, if you uh, bring this over to the other side, you get two of them. But look, we got um, V2 final is plus on both sides, right? So you just subtract it off. And we find V1 final is minus V1 final. Well, two V1 final is equal to zero, V1 final is equal to zero. So the first one stops. That's what the demonstration had happen, right? Let's find V2 final. So we plug back into either one of these two, uh, plug into the second. Uh, V, uh, V1 initial is just V, I guess, so we can write V. Uh, v, well, I can write one initial since I've been doing that, is equal to V2 final minus zero. <clears throat> well, I can just circle this part. So V2 final goes off with the initial V and V1 final is zero. This is a standard example of an elastic collision. If it was inelastic collisions, you wouldn't have this second one. So we'd have to give you enough that you can solve it from just that problem. Sometimes we do it by saying, oh, they stick together. And if they stuck together, then I'd have the same uh, V final, and that would still be zero, and I'd be given this, and if the masks are all the same, they'd still cancel out, and I'd just get um, twice the new V final is equal to the um, the initial, and that would um, solve it in a perfectly inelastic case. So you can set this up both ways and you can get uh, the answer. That's why we like perfectly elastic because you don't have to say so much. Otherwise, it's basically rattling off all the numbers in here, except for <clears throat> um, the one you're solving for. And so that's all you can do in a collision, right? Okay, so that's a couple of examples there. Uh, let me um, <clears throat> then move on to torque and static equilibrium. Sorry, I've lost my, lost my focus here. Let me get it back. So we focus up close and we slowly bring it down. This camera is kind of funny this way. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> so, chapter nine. Also on this test three, torque. There is um, a formula we always use for this. Torque equals the radius from the axis to the force applied point times the force times sine phi. And what often comes up as a question is, what phi? So let's draw an example here. Let's suppose that I've got an axis right here. And I apply a force like this. The 
and we think of what possible angles do we have here? Well, one thing I tell you is if you start phi over here on the same uh, line as from the axle up to where the force is applied, I extend that a little bit long for longer. I go around this counterclockwise over to the force, then you get V. And if you use this, then you get um, the, um, the sine and uh, value from sine phi. In other words, if you use that angle, you just plug it into this and it'll tell you if it's plus or minus. Uh, now, another thing you could use, uh, you could use this angle here, call it theta, or we could use this angle over here, which is 180 degrees minus theta. And so, which of those do you use? Well, the sine of theta is equal to the sine of 180 degrees minus theta. So it doesn't matter which, use either. <clears throat> but, um, you need to uh, manually put in the sign. <clears throat> All right, so if it's going around this way, it's minus. If it's going counterclockwise, it's plus. You just have to manually stick that in front of this formula because you're not using this phi, which does it for you, using one of those, which doesn't. But the important point is it doesn't really matter if you use this side or that side. If you're using ones that are less than 180, so you get a positive sign. Remember, the sine function is positive until you get to 180. And it goes negative all the way around until zero again. Uh, so because of this fact, you can check on your calculator as much as you want. Uh, it doesn't matter what you use. Now, there is one angle here. And I sort of messed that picture up. So if I take this angle right here, and suppose I give you this angle as 30 degrees. I'm applying the force still down here. And then this angle doesn't really do any for anything for you. Doesn't help for uh, F unless you do some geometry uh, to get uh, one of these angles that do help. So if we're given something over here to the x-axis, the only thing it's really good for is figuring out through geometry what one of those two angles are. The only stuff that matters is the line goes from the axis out to where the force is applied and the angle of the force. So x-axis, who cares? Unless it's gonna give you one of those angles, you don't care. That can be extraneous information sometimes, or sometimes you actually have to use geometry to get it. For example, if we had the weight of this thing going straight down, okay, well that matters. If straight down is minus y, minus y is related to plus x. So you can do some geometry and get the other angle out. <laughs> but um, sometimes it's just useless. Okay, so that is our uh, static, that's torque. Now static equilibrium is really an exercise uh, in uh, Newton's second law. And so you're going to draw your free body diagram. You start with a rod. Uh, mark the
Axis, your choice. You, you put it where a lot of forces you don't know, you're gonna have no torque because you put it right where they act. That'll probably make it easier. Then you make your chart. Force, X, Y, torque. And then you write down like the weight and what all the other forces might be. You part take the uh, you project for x, you project uh, for y, and for torque you get plus and minus right, R F sine B. So go to go through and calculate out just like we did here. And then you take and you sum it up here, torque net is equal to I alpha is equal to zero if it's static. And oftentimes this is the only column you need. Sometimes that's all you need. And sometimes you have to sum these up and get F net is equal to M A X is equal to zero and F net in the Y direction is M A Y is equal to zero. And again, the zeros come from static. If you choose the wrong axis, you'll probably need these. If you choose the right axis, you may not need those, only need this one. If you want two things, don't expect to get it from one equation. You're going to have to use one of those. So if you notice, so I can get everything from just the torque equation, then you could skip these two columns and just do that one. Uh, save you some time. Or you could draw them in and just fill this one out. <clears throat> save some time. And if you need the others, you can go back and fill those out. Uh, so this is how you do a static equilibrium problem. And how do you tell static equilibrium problems? Well, they're static. No motion. It kind of cuts out uh, any changes in potential energy or any uh, constant acceleration. It's zero. It doesn't tell you anything. So they're usually pretty easy to spot. And it's things like you know, we've got a wall and, and our old signpost held up by some uh, uh, string and it's got a mass, it's got its own weight and it's got, oftentimes we'll hang some other mass from it. So that's got another weight coming down, we've got tension going up. That's your typical problem. And you've got to work out the angles for the torques, just like you did up here. Um, don't forget the 90 degrees here. Don't forget the plus and minuses, right? These are trying to pull it clockwise. They're both negative. That's trying to pull it counterclockwise. That's positive. There's a couple of forces over here, right? Your reaction forces. That's the weight of the rod. And then you've got the, the weight of the mass hanging down. And you've got tension here uh, going upwards. You're going to have to know either the angle down here or the angle up here, or you can find that angle down there. If this is horizontal, it makes it easier. These are right. If it's not horizontal, it makes it harder because you have to figure the angles out. But you know what angles to look for. Uh, so I presume you can do that. We'll do some more examples uh, later. <clears throat> uh, and you can look back and see examples I've already done. I don't want to take too long going through these steps here. So next we get to rotational motion, rotational kinematics. We have, um, whenever you see this, you say, okay, I have delta theta, I have omega initial, I have omega. Sometimes this is omega naught, <clears throat> I have omega, I have alpha, and I have time. And so time, you see time, uh, it's pretty hard to get it other ways, what we're doing than 
than this, except if it's a simple speed problem. Uh, that's a definition type by our way of doing things. <clears throat> uh, the alpha here is a constant. And it's just a matter of writing these down, which do you have or want? And which don't you care about? Pick your equation, you solve it. Pick the wrong equation, you're probably going to have to get two equations and two unknowns and get back to it. It's better to pick the right equation that doesn't have the one that you don't care about in it. Uh, so make sure you have those around on your equation sheet. If you forget to put the rotational down, remember x goes to theta, omega goes to, uh, well, I can actually write this down for you, can't I? I'll just write a little box up here. As a reminder, <clears throat> is that delta uh, theta times r gives you your delta x. <clears throat> Uh, r omega is equal to v tangential and r alpha is equal to a tangential. You might say, well, what about v radial? What about a radial? Well, a radial is acentripetal and acentripetal is v squared of r or using this, r omega squared. Uh, they're perpendicular to each other. The centripetal one turns. This one actually changes how fast it goes. How fast it goes is, of course, the tangential. Uh, and um, so this, if you take and say, well, <clears throat> if I drop r's everywhere, because they all have r's except t, then uh, the delta x equation uh, well, you replace delta theta for delta x, omega for v, alpha for a, and you get the same equations as you had before. So there's a translation table. Should you forget to write down those equations? Okay, rotational dynamics. Again, you calculate torque. As, on, as we just did, add them. as we just did, uh, and set equal to I alpha. Now this little A means about some axis So you have to make sure that you're calculating torque about the same axis you have the moment of inertia about. This is to remind you of that. Normally we'll just write I alpha saying, well, of course you have to know what axis your I is about. But this here, if you don't know what that A is, it's about the axis that you're looking at. They both begin with A, you can put it for either one you want. <clears throat> uh, so uh, this is, by the way, is nothing more than Newton's second law. If you look at what we did from Newton's second law, <clears throat> we sum up the torque column, we set equal to I alpha, right? This is this. Nothing more, nothing less. So kinematics do the second law. Uh, next you get to energy methods. And so energy methods are uh, things like <clears throat> um, Burke, non-conserving is equal to delta Ke, let's put translational, plus delta Ke rotational, plus delta Pe gravity, plus delta Pe spring. Might as well write everything out. And if you can also just write this as, okay, delta Ke plus delta Pe, and that's uh, translational plus rotational, and that's for um, gravity and spring and whatever else you may have. 
So this still works. It's just you have to remember there's two pieces to KE. And has, as there has been, there's as many pieces you need for potential energy. Whatever conservative forces you have, stick their potential energies in there and add them all up. <clears throat> so let's do an example for this. So a, uh, a cylinder. radius r mass m rolls down a hill with vertical displacement h without slipping What is its speed at the bottom? So I tell you to draw pictures, so I'll draw a picture. There's our cylinder. This is the initial place. And uh, Rolls from rest. That's what this little space is from rest. So it starts there, and the final is it's down here, and it's moving with some velocity v. That's the speed at the bottom. And so the speed at the bottom gives you a hint. Hmm. Maybe it's energy, especially when you see vertical displacement h that makes you think of uh, delta p e gravity is, is equal to uh, mgh. In fact, it's negative because you're going downhill. <clears throat> and uh, you say, OK, uh, now so you look more like energy. And rolls, of course, is a key word is that you need Ke translational and Ke rotational. So we'll need both. <clears throat> the vertical height here, it goes down, is h. And so we write down work non conserving is delta Ke uh, translational plus delta Ke rotational plus delta PE. We've determined that it loses this much because uh, Y final is less than Y initial. So y has to go this way if you're going to use uh, MGY for gravity. And so you get a negative sign. So we can just plug that in down here. It starts from rest. which means uh, Ke initial is equal to zero, both parts summed. And it is not slipping. There's no slipping. How can you have any friction? It's zero. And you get zero is equal to uh, Ke translational final plus Ke rotational final. I got rid of the initials because they're both zero, right? There's really a minus zero here and a minus zero there. And then there's the minus m g h. That's the only change of potential energy we have. <clears throat> OK, get some letters into this. O is equal to 1 half m b final squared plus 1 half i omega squared uh, minus m g h. OK, I guess our mass, we'd be using a little one, so we better use a little one. Less to change. OK, now uh, my moment of inertia. I cylinder, 
about the center, which is what it's rolling here, uh, is equal to one half mr squared. This is something that you'd be given uh, for all but a point mass. or a hoop, which is the same thing. <clears throat> same thing in terms of the formula, they're both mr squared. <clears throat> uh, for a cylinder like this, a uh, solid cylinder, I probably should write that down. Because if it's not a solid cylinder, if it's hollow, then it's really a hoop. And we're using a solid cylinder here. Uh, solid cylinder, by the way, is also a disc. It's another word we use for it. And so uh, I can put that into here. And I realize, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. <clears throat> I'm told the radius, I'm told the mass. Uh, I'm told the height, I know G. We've got a Megan here and VF. And that's a problem, which, which we're solving for, right? So, uh, seem to have two variables. Omega v final, but uh, v final, we know for rolling without slip <clears throat> that uh, r times omega is equal to v final. Uh, so omega is equal, since I want V final, I'm going to solve for omega. Omega is V final over R. Okay, so let's plug these things in here. Zero is equal to one half M V final squared plus one half I is one half M R squared. Omega is V final over R. So V final squared over R squared minus M G H. Well, r squared goes with r squared. Take an m from here and an m from there and an m from there and an m from there <clears throat> and rewrite it. <clears throat> and let's move the mgh over to the other side. Now it's just a gh. And you get uh, gh is equal to one half plus one quarter times v final squared. So v final is then the square root of, this is three quarters, so I multiply both sides by four thirds, four thirds g h. Now if I had a different moment of inertia here, some factor times mr squared, if I had a I had a bigger moment of inertia, this would be bigger, this would be smaller, because remember, uh, we had to divide by this here. And so for a uh, bigger moment of inertia, you get smaller v, there's smaller moment of inertia here, smaller factor out in front, then they'd add up to something smaller here, I divide by something smaller, I get something bigger. And so that's the qualitative thing that we learned from the station. Okay, so that's our example for this. Now we have conservation of angular momentum. And first we need to know what angular momentum is. L is equal to I times Omega for everything. Uh, L uh, is equal to I times Omega is equal to uh, R M V sine V for a point mass. 
cars for a point mass, we know that I is simply mR squared. And if you use the same omega that we did before is V over R as V tangential, then you say, oh, hey, these things are the same stuff. MRV tangential. And what is V sine theta? That's V tangential. So really, they're the same formula. If you just plug MR squared in here and realize what V tangential goes to omega. <clears throat> uh, but in any case, uh, that is so rarely but sometimes useful. Uh, this works for everything, including your point mass. Although if you've got an object flying and hit something, boom, uh, that may not be quite so interesting. So uh, this is sort of a easy formula to plug into. Um, so first you need to know How to get I and depends on the axis. Uh, you can add up the parts. Um, if you have point masses, uh, and Next thing you need to know is uh, the basic formula is the momentum conservation, which is uh, I one initial omega initial plus I two initial uh, omega one initial. Omega two initial is equal to I one final, omega one final plus I two final, omega two final. And you might say, why do I put an initial on I or a final on I? And you have to remember that uh, on some of these problems, you have uh, I changes. So the, um, <clears throat> you know, on the person in the stool with weights, uh, the, um, you move the weights, you change I. The same with the skater, holds your arms up, pulls your arms in, you're changing eye. And so some problems they get, especially they're just one object, eye changes, and that's why omega changes. So we, we put the eye here, whereas we don't usually put it in the mass uh, because that's a, uh, that's an issue. <laughs> Uh, so I guess I probably should show you an example about this. Um, so a uh, rod rotates. while the masses are, well, well, the, let's say two, masses uh, M each are uh, rotating, uh, okay, rotates, uh, while two masses each are a distance R on either side of the axis. Uh, the masses 
are brought closer to half their initial distance. from the axis and uh, how does the the um, rotation of the masses and rod change speed of the masses and massless rod change. And so uh, draw a picture here. We have initial. There are masses. Final. And it's rotating. I assume it's rotating positive at omega initial. This is a distance r, that is a distance r, that's m, that's m. The final case, this is it here, this is my axis in the middle, axis is still in the middle, this is r over 2, this is r over 2, m, m. <clears throat> And now it's rotating at some omega final. So the uh, you look at this problem, and you didn't know what part we we're doing an example for. Uh, the masses are brought closer to half the initial. So this is something abrupt, and it's. No details given. It makes us think of collision. And of course it rotates, so that's rotational. And so we then think this is probably a rotational collision. And so you have angular momentum conservation. So let's try it and see if we get anywhere doing that. Angular momentum conservation, uh, we just wrote out. Uh, I uh, They're both going at the same omega, so I can write I uh, one initial plus I two initial going at omega initial is equal to, and they're both going together over here. So I can write I one final plus I two final omega final. So I can write then omega final is equal to, I divide both sides by this, I one initial plus I two initial divided by I one final plus I two final times omega initial. So by how does the rotation speed change? It's going to be some factor times omega initial. This is my factor. I need to calculate this. So I need to know I initial is equal to what? First, it's the same for both. And it's equal to the point masses and so I can write m r squared. Okay, over here I final, it's again same for both. Again their points so it's equal to m, but now it's r divided by 2 that's squared. And that is 1 quarter m r squared. 
So I take this and I shove it back in here. Omega final is equal to the initial case here. I've got mr squared plus mr squared. In the final case, I have one quarter mr squared plus one quarter mr squared. Omega initial. I can factor the quarter out on the bottom. Uh, one over one quarter of two m r squareds over two m r squareds times omega initial. And so my omega final here, one over one quarter is a four, because you multiply top and bottom by four, the bottom of four over four goes to one. Uh, those just cancel out, omega initial. So that's the sort of problem you can do. And this case is one where the moment of inertia changed. I'll give an example like that. Other examples, it may not change. But you do need to know how to calculate these. You do need to. So this system has a moment of inertia of the sum of those two. So the system has 2 mr squared. Right, this 2 mr squared, that's the, the system i is the 2. And i initial, I guess I should say. System i initial final is 2 mr squared over 4, so a half mr squared. <clears throat> OK, back to our topic sh sheet. Uh, we've done chapter 10. We now go on to simple harmonic motion. Now, <clears throat> the time, uh, the, these two here, we're just going to look at on this sheet of paper here. There's this pendulum, there's the spring mass of the elastic. Uh, and the equations here. One thing I do want to do with this, this is, of course, is a plug-in. But uh, don't forget it. What I want to do on this piece of paper is show you the time plots, right? If I plot uh, position versus time, then I may get something like this. And I can plot, you know, from this place to the same place. That's a period because that's time. If I go from here, going down, crossing zero, to going down, crossing zero, that's also the period. And this is the amplitude minus the amplitude. If I was to plot V, versus time. Then, okay, the velocity is zero there, it's maximum negative there, so it's looking something like this. And again, if I go to downward crossing zero, downward crossing zero, that is the period because this is the time. And I also could say, well, if I draw a little bit more of this anyway, uh, that if I went from the lower max to the lower max, that also would be the period. <clears throat> so you can read um, the uh, you can read the period off the graph because it is connected to time. And the top of the V one here is equal to a omega squared a omega. There's no, nothing there. It's just a omega. And this down here is minus a omega. And although that minus is out here. <clears throat> now, if we make a spatial plot, then we are plotting y is a function of x, and it may look like this. <clears throat> but now, if I draw this to the same point, 
it's the wavelength. It's the wavelength because that's a distance. So if you take one of these plots as versus time, you get the period. It doesn't matter if you're plotting x, v, or a. That's the period because it's time. If you take the y versus x, that's the distance on x. That's the wavelength. Now, <clears throat> of course, you need to remember the t is equal to 1 over f. Uh, and omega is equal to 2 pi f. And so if you put this into there, you get um, uh, 1 over f is 2 pi over omega. So you can put 2 pi over omega in for t. And so you can get omega from that. Uh, t is also equal to 2 pi over omega. <clears throat> and so you, from this plot, you get t, you get omega, you get a. What can you do with that? You can fill in omega and a, or you can fill in omega times a, or omega squared times a, and all those omegas. Phi, you have to get by where it starts. If it's x and it starts up here, looks like a cosine, it's cosine phi is zero. If it's velocity and it starts like a minus sine wave, okay, phi is zero. If it's anything else, it starts at zero with x, then phi's gonna be something different. Uh, so, uh, if you start with a picture, get to these equations, pull out the values from the equations. This is the maximum v. This is a max. Right? So you need to be able to go from a picture to equations. You need to be able to go from equations with numbers such as uh, V is equal to uh, 35 meters per second uh, sine of uh, 12 T plus pi to values and that's something like, okay, that's omega, that's V. This is V max, which is equal to uh, A times omega. So you can get A. And from omega, you can get F and T. So we can ask for any of those. So equation numbers, we'll be able to get to those. And three, uh, you'll be able to plug uh, into the equation and get a number given t. And you're plugging in radiance mode. on your calculator. So this is the test where you have to make sure that you watch what mode your calculator is in. If you're using angles for torque, they're often given in degrees. Calculator should be in degrees mode. If you use an omega t, omega's in radians. Better go to radians mode. On this test, be sure that you check your calculator mode. If you have an angle in degrees for the torque, it should be degrees mode. If you have omega t is in radians, that means it needs to be in radians mode. I'm sure at this point you know how to switch it this is something you need to double check on your test before you finish each of those four questions. Did I use my calculator in the right mode? It only matters if you use trig functions.
trig and trig to the minus one. The sines, cosines, inverse sines, inverse cosines, inverse tangents, tangents. Any of those, it matters. So you're multiplying two numbers together, it doesn't matter what mode the calculator is in. It only matters if you're doing sines, cosines, tangents, or their inverses. Trigonometric stuff is the only time it's going to matter which mode it is. But when you're doing one of those, before you push that sine or cosine or tangent button or the inverse of those, make sure you think about what mode your calculator is in. Okay, and a couple of examples then. So up just as the general stuff, you'd be able to be able to go back and forth for all these things. Then read the examples of that in class and go back to that if you don't remember. If you have an elastic system, a spring mass will sometimes ask you this problem. So, okay, you have a mass and it's on a spring with a certain K. What's the uh, frequency? Does resonant at? or it vibrates back and forth at. Well, omega is K over M, and you still have these. These things still work for this. These things still work for that. And uh, so don't forget, if you have omega and you want frequency, you can use the formula. If you want period, use the formula. Then we've worked it out, wrote it down for the period here. But this is, of course, is equal to 2 pi frequency of the spring because that's what omega is. <clears throat> and so, uh, and this is one over the frequency of the pendulum. That's, that's what they're related by. <clears throat> so the other things, of course, is this is the total energy. That is equal to um, uh, Ke plus Pe is equal to one half mv squared plus in this case, it's one half k x squared. And if you solve these guys, you guess what? You get that. <clears throat> and what does this mean? That's nothing more than omega squared times x with a uh, minus sign in front of it. Um, and that's come straight up from the top here, because omega squared is k over m. <clears throat> so uh, the uh, these are all related to each other. And down here, this is also, of course, equal to ke plus pe, but this time it's a half mv squared plus mgy. <clears throat> and so you could, it's not as easy a formula as this, but you can relate y to, to um, v with these equations. <clears throat> so something about energy and a few definitions here. That's to keep in mind. And you're plugging them in. I don't think you have too much trouble with these. You might do an example too practice tests. Okay, and so um, common scenarios, these things I've already talked about. Here are our examples. So this is Vmax, this is Omega. If I asked you what is A, A is equal to uh, A Omega divided by Omega, which is 33 meters per second divided by, um, this by the way is V max, which then isn't so obvious as A omega or omega is A, then divided by 52 radians per second. And the per seconds cancel out, the radians are non-unit, you get meters. So it's 33 over 52 meters is the amplitude of the motion here. And we may ask for this and give you that. Right? You have to be able to do that yourself because these are things that you're supposed to know. We may even just tell you this is V max. We don't necessarily tell you it's that, but I presume you'll get that because um, if you have this around, it's a very useful page, this information. You may, you may, although, T's here are a little bit redundant 
because you have these two. And we already talked about this. Uh, what is t? Well, if that's five, and then you say six, seven, eight, you know, this is probably, it's a little bit more than five. It's either six or seven. <clears throat> and the amplitude, this is, uh, well, that's a good question. If this is a omega, then this is plot of v. And v max is equal to one. You can say, okay, from if we actually put the lines, you could tell if this was six or seven, then uh, we could ask what the t is, you ask what the period is, you ask what omega is, or we could just simply ask you, what is a? And you have to get omega from this and solve it just like we did down here to get a. And this is the kind of how to make it a little bit harder than absolutely trivial from reading things off the graph. And over here, okay, you can plug in and get a value for one of these things at a certain time. Those are our common things to do there. Now chapter 17, which is the last of our chapters. In fact, our test cuts off here. Because uh, this is 17D and this is 17B ends up here. And so this is a formula. Uh, just be ready to plug into it. <clears throat> and over here is uh, Another formula, you may have to use more than once. And we have this formula for beta. It's also useful to go the other way around on this thing here. And that is, how do you get I from beta? And so if you, um, if you divide beta by 10, raise it to the power of 10 to get rid of this, you can actually figure out what the, um, what the relation is going in the other direction, so to speak. And so uh, if you take this thing here and you write uh, 10 to the beta over 10, because they divide both sides by beta, is equal to 10 to the log of i over uh, 1 e minus 12. 10 to the log just cancels out. And so I multiply by 1 e times 10 to the minus 12. I get i is equal to 10 to the uh, beta over 10 minus 12. And so this is beta in dB. And I get I in uh, watts per meter squared. So this is a useful equation for going backwards. You've probably used it a lot in your homework. So if I have noise of, say, uh, 30 dB, <clears throat> beta over 10 is 3. 3 minus 12 is minus 9. 10 to minus 9 watts per meter squared. I don't think you want to go on this thing backwards. I'd suggest you put that on your equation sheet as well as this on your equation sheet. So you can go either way without having to redrive it every time. Uh, so that's my hint there. And this one. What can we do here? We can give you a temperature, ask for speed. We can give you a speed, ask for temperature. Not too much else to do with that, except we could uh, make you combine uh, this thing from a couple of slides ago. Right. V equals F lambda. V can change your temperature. So we can give you some initial lambdas and Vs, change the temperature, and ask for you know, the final one. Frequency, of course, doesn't depend on temperature, but if temperature changes, this does to work, so lambda will change. So that is 
Um, that's the other thing that comes up. And this is the end of this topic. Now I'm gonna put another one up where I'll give you hints and, and run through the practice test. I don't want you to do that until after uh, you've finished studying, taking the practice test, then you can look at that because I don't want you to have seen the problems and how to start them until you take the practice test. That's where you practice to see if you know that or not. You want those problems to be unknown ahead of time. And so I'll put that up in a separate video and I'll probably delay a little bit just to give you time to make sure that you get through that practice test first. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the end of our, the end of our recording today. So there we go, bye.